Disney's earnings are out, and the market seems pretty happy with what Disney reported and what the conference call sounded like. Bob Iger was really pretty bullish on Disney's future. That's not very surprising, but some of the details around what he's seeing in the future, what sort of releases are coming up in not only 2024, but 2025 and also 2026, were I think really encouraging. At least the plan that he's building at Disney is starting to make some sense. And from a financial perspective, the cost cuts that the company put in place are starting to impact the bottom line. And if you if you take anything away from this earnings report, from this video, understand that Disney is now starting to realize that it needs to be a profitable company. It needs to be a company that makes better content and then distributes that content, whether that's on streaming or linear TV, profitably. So the days of growing at all costs, particularly on the streaming side, are over, and the focus is going to be on the bottom line more and more. So that plays into a lot of pieces of the business, whether that's Disney Plus, Hulu, or a lot of the sports assets that Disney is starting to build out and eventually distribute. We're not going to see ESPN over the top, it sounds like, until August 2025. But we are going to see this joint venture that they announced yesterday come to market relatively soon. So I'm going to go through the earnings report. There's a lot to get to. I'm probably going to miss something. But I want to hit all the high-level marks and why the stock is up 7% after hours. Because I think this is relatively encouraging. Because at least we're starting to see what the turnaround is going to look like for Disney long term. My name is Travis Holliam. Thanks for watching Asymmetric Investing. Please subscribe here on YouTube for all my content. And thanks to this video sponsor, The Motley Fool. If you go to fool.com slash ASYM, they'll give you their top 10 stocks to buy right now. So let's turn to the report and go through some of the numbers for the quarter. This is the quarterly report. You can see that revenue was flat from a year ago at $23.5 billion. Earnings per share, though, increased to $1.04 per share from $0.70 cents per share. Excluding, including certain items, one-time items, this is the non-GAAP earnings that a lot of times analyst estimates are compared to. Earnings were $1.22 per share from 99, from $0.99 cents a year ago. So again, what you're seeing is not necessarily growth on the top line, but cost cuts started to make the company a little bit more efficient. And eventually, you're going to start to see the revenue side growing. We'll get into some of those details. The cost numbers that Disney really wanted to highlight was $500 million in SG&A expense savings uh, for the fiscal first quarter. Remember, this is Disney's fiscal first quarter, calendar fourth quarter of 2023. And they're on track to ex meet or exceed $7.5 billion in annualized savings that Iger put in place when he took the CEO job back last year. For the full year, they're expecting earnings to be about $4.60. So this is where you look at the stock price. It was a little bit below $100 per share. If we just use that $100 mark, $4.60, you get to a price to earnings multiple just a little over 20 in that 21, 22 range. So it's a pretty reasonable valuation for a company that's as high quality as Disney and who is growing the bottom line. Uh, free cash flow is expected to be about $8 billion, and they're going to use that in a number of different ways. Announced an investment in Epic that'll be $1.5 billion dollars. They're buying the rest of Hulu and, of course, pouring more and more money back into the parks long term. That would that capital expenditure would come out of free cash flow. But there's a lot of investments going on. The segment results is really where you get to the nitty gritty. Entertainment, sports and experiences are the three segments that Disney is reporting now. So entertainment is going to include the streaming business, the studios, the linear TV business. So ESPN, ABC, businesses like that. Sports is going to be primarily ESPN. That's the main business that's under sports right now. And experience is, is going to be parks, cruises, anything, basically anything with a ticket involved for a customer. So you can see that entertainment revenue dropped 7%. And this is because of the decline in the linear TV bundle, people cutting the cord. And this is kind of the existential crisis for ESPN and a lot of the content and media companies right now because... If people are cutting cable, where are they going? Maybe they're spending money on streaming, but streaming isn't profitable. So it just creates a lot of conflicts for a business like Disney's when you when your previous cash flow business is starting to be in decline. So 7% drop there, but there was more than 100% increase in operating income. And this is part of those cost cuts that we talked about earlier starting to take hold. So it's not only cuts at ESPN, which have been made, it's cuts in the studio business, it's really all over the place from a content creation and distribution standpoint, from studios to linear TV, and then also direct to consumer as well. On the sports side, 
revenue was actually up 4%. Iger has talked about this a little bit in the past where revenue is maybe a little bit stronger than a lot of people think at ESPN because advertisers are looking for what are people actually seeking out and watching. And that is sports on ESPN and content that they're produce, producing there. So revenue is maybe not as bad as a lot of people think from the ESPN side of things. That's why revenue is up 4%. But we did see a loss of $103 million on an operating income basis. Experiences continues to be the cash cow for Disney. This is really no surprise. And what you want to see is just continued strength there, continued momentum in the experiences business. Revenue up 7% to $9.1 billion and operating income $3.1 billion. So this is something that they're going to continue investing in. Management has said they're going to put $60 billion into experiences in the future. And that sounds like it's going to be capacity expansions across the board. This was a something they talked about a fair amount on the conference call, but it's not just building one new resort. It's going to be more capacity and attractions at all of their resorts around the world and then potentially another major new resort as well. And will also include more cruise lines. I believe they said five cruise lines are under construction. So a lot of capacity expansion. The entertainment business is where you're going to get the breakdown between linear networks. So this is going to include the Disney Channel, ABC, all of those linear TV networks that go along with ESPN. So a lot of times what Disney does is they bundle those together when they're negotiating a contract with cable providers. This is going to be the non-ESPN piece of that bundle. Revenue was down 12%. This is partially because they lost some of those channels in negotiations with Charter recently. So Charter basically said, hey, we want you to include streaming and we just want kind of your best content. We want ESPN, ABC, but we don't want all these ancillary channels that nobody actually watches. And we're not going to say pay a quarter per subscriber each month for, for those channels, which is what Disney was able to do previously is just kind of shove these other channels into the bundle that they were negotiating. So that's why you see the revenue drop there is because they don't quite have the same negotiating power with cable providers. And as a result, you see a 7% decline in operating income. But look at this margin here. I think this is really tremendous. $2.8 billion in revenue, $1.2 billion in operating income. So margins are really strong at the places that at the legacy linear network business. Obviously, it's a concern that it's in decline, but you want to just cash flow that as much as you possibly can. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Disney sell some of these assets, but which exactly they would sell, I don't think is necessarily clear right now. Direct-to-consumer, this is the streaming business, up 15%. But look at this revenue, $5.5 billion in revenue, exceeding linear network revenue. Not going to be the same margin in the future, but I do think the opportunity from a revenue perspective is much bigger, and that's something that investors need to keep in mind. Losses improved 86% from a $984 million loss a year ago to $138 million in the most recent quarter. So they're expecting to be operating income positive by the end of the fiscal year. So it's going to be three quarters from now. And you're seeing a lot of momentum in the direct in that direction. Some of that's cost cuts, some of that's price increases. But before long, we are going to see this direct-to-consumer business turn positive on an operating income basis. This is just some more detail on linear networks, declines in particularly domestic revenue. No big surprise there. Some of the information broken out about the streaming business is really going around as a potential negative 1% drop at a 1.3 million subscriber drop in Disney's core markets is the US, Canada, and other international markets that don't include the hot star locations primarily in India. So this is really where you want to see growth. I was hoping these numbers were going to be a little bit stronger on the back of strong subscription numbers from Netflix, but that wasn't the case. And the reason for that is because Disney instituted some price increases late in 2023, and that's impacting those Disney Plus numbers. Now, I'll get to the Hulu numbers in a second, but Hulu is actually a beneficiary. So when you add those two together, the numbers were actually up slightly, but Disney Plus was definitely down just a little bit in the quarter. They're expecting that to turn positive in the future, especially as some of these cable deals start to bundle in Disney Plus with the cable subscription. So that's going to be something to also keep in mind. They're expecting, I believe there's about 5 million additions in the next quarter. So this is going to start to go positive relatively soon. Hulu, the video yeah. on demand, which is the traditional Hulu service, is really what you want to keep an eye on, up 3% or 1.2 million subscribers. So like I said, offset almost all of the losses that Disney Plus 
core. And then price increases are starting to impact Disney, $8.15, up 9% from a year ago. On the total core market, we're up 2%. So you're going to start to see that push higher really across the board. And then the other thing that you want to see is lower churn. That's something that was elevated last quarter, but I think long-term as you start bundling things like Disney Plus with Hulu and potentially ESPN over the top starting in 2025, that's where you're going to start to see this business really pick up. Here's the sports business. I talked a lot about this already. Revenue up 1% domestically, 1% internationally. Uh, the star, the Indian operations actually did really well, up 71%. So that's where a lot of the growth came from. And then operating income was pretty strong, especially domestically, $255 million in operating income. These losses come from Star India. And this is, again, why Disney is not investing quite as much, particularly in India, because the prices that you can charge are relatively low and the costs are high. So it hasn't proven to be profitable on either the sports side or with the streaming business, which is hot star experiences, domestic markets up 4%. So not a lot of growth in domestic markets, but international, what you're seeing here is the reopening in China specifically, and the ability for Chinese consumers to travel and also the Shanghai park being open. So that's why you see a 35% increase in revenue and you see a similar impact on operating income down 2% at domestic parks, but up over 100% to $328 million at international parks. Thanks to our friends at The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. Visit fool.com slash ASYM for the top 10 stocks to buy right now. So the big thing for Disney is going to be the turnaround of the studios. And this is one of the things that's going to take a while. I think when Iger took over the company again in 2023, it was clear that they needed to make some changes at studios deliver less content and higher quality content. So that's really what they're working on now. A lot of the movies that were either announced or we knew were coming out are sequels. So you have Moana 2, which is going to be coming later this year. There's another Toy Story movie. There's another Zootopia movie. So there's an, a lot of more content that's on the sequel side that con continues to come out. But the originals that would have started, let's say when Bi Bob Iger took over again, that takes a few years. Those movies don't just form out of thin air. It takes three or four years to develop the idea, to build out the characters, to write the script, to record it, animate it. All of those things take quite a while. So Bob Iger was talking a lot about the content improvements that are probably going to be hitting the company more like in the 2025 and 2026 range. So from a content perspective, this is going to be kind of a lull for Disney. And this is actually what typically happens throughout Disney's history. You have these hit segments where they have just massive hits over and over for about a decade. And then you have a five to 10 year slump. And I think that's what we're in right now. But shoring up the business is the parks business. And then they're really positioning the rest of the business for the future. So the linear TV business is obviously not going to be the future, but now you need to shape what this streaming business is going to look like. So you have Disney plus, I think that's going to be, I think that continues to be a really strong business. You'd like to see the subscriber number increase from where it is. We'll probably see that over time. But the first step is going to be increasing prices and getting this to a profitable point. You're starting to bundle in Hulu. And then in 2025, you layer in ESPN. And Iger talked about that ESPN experience being really a fully immersive ESPN experience. So including live stats and live betting, everything that you would expect from a full streaming service. So that'll be really interesting to see what that is when that comes out. But that's probably like going to command a much higher price, more in the $15, $20, $30 per subscriber. And again, that will be bundled with Disney Plus and Hulu. One of the things that I took away from the call was actually the deal that was announced, the joint venture that was announced with Fox and Time Warner is probably not as big a deal as it seemed initially. So what they're basically going to do is take their TV networks and just put them on a streaming service. But it doesn't sound like there's going to be a lot more than that behind it. And Disney is really thinking about what they're going to do with ESPN and how they're going to include ESPN and not necessarily that joint venture with Disney Plus and Hulu. So that was, I think, a big takeaway from the call was that Disney is really still thinking about this bundle, going it alone, and with ESPN being that center point from a sports perspective. So we'll see how that plays out. There's a lot of dominoes left to fall, especially given the fact that you have NBA negotiations coming up. We don't know exactly what sports rights are going to be available on ESPN or any of these other streamers. 
But I think generally the takeaway from this quarter is that the strategy is being laid out and it's starting to not only make sense, it's starting to gain momentum. The cost structure is a little bit better than it was a year ago. We have to wait for some of the content to actually hit. That's going to be more like late this year and into 2025. But parks and cruises continue to do really well. And I think Disney has the right strategy going forward. I'd like to see them reduce their debt level. I'd like to see more content end up on some of these streaming services. But we'll see if things like the Taylor Swift movie, which is going to be coming to Disney Plus, attracts a number of subscribers. That's very possible that that's going to be one of these big wins. And one of those things that Disney really learns from, I think Netflix has really paved the way there for the way to attract subscribers and then keep them with kind of those big tentpole events. But overall, I think the quarter was relatively good. I'm maybe not as, as impressed as the market is given the stocks increase after the market closed. But I think this is still one of the companies that's going to be a juggernaut in media and actually the last 24 hours in the joint venture that was announced and these results, I think, really shows that some of the other companies, so think about NBC Universal, Paramount, they're really in trouble. I don't know where they go in the future. And even Fox is maybe in a weaker position if this joint venture isn't going to be that big a deal for Disney and the other companies that would potentially distribute it. So I would much rather be in Disney than I would in those kind of companies. But what do you think about Disney's results? Leave your comments in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to Asymmetric Investing. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you here next time.